the past, royalty earned their status through acts of heroism and bravery. They came to believe that there was something special about their blood. It was even rumored to be blue. To them, it was essential that their blood did not mix with that of mere commoners. Well, the royals always saw themselves as a race apart. This is why royals married other royals, why they would never allow um, any marriage out of a royal family. It didn't matter if a princess was ugly or stupid or ill or anything. As long as she was a member of a royal family, this is really what was most important. For most monarchs, passing on the royal blood to the next generation was vital. But for Queen Victoria, this obsession had tragic consequences. At Buckingham Palace, on the 7th of April, 1853, Queen Victoria was in labor with her eighth child. At quarter past one, she gave birth to what appeared to be a healthy little boy, her fourth son, Leopold. At first sight, there was nothing wrong with Leopold. But tragically, he was to have the most miserable and lonely childhood of any of Victoria's children. Victoria barely acknowledged him, and when she did, it was only to find fault with him. But what no one knew was that from birth, this little boy suffered from a disease that was to ravage the royal houses of Europe. Leopold grew up with his brothers and sisters at Osborne House on the Isle of Wight. But as he got older, it became clear that he was different. He was particularly clumsy and took days in bed to recover from what appeared to be only minor accidents. But when mysterious bruises kept appearing on him, the doctors became concerned. He'd had a bruise, um, and it appears that he had a swollen lip, so he must have fallen on his face, um, that left him bedridden for about a week. But it was at that point they really started to realize that there was more to it than just a clumsy child. OK. Whenever Leopold suffered a fall, his bruises became horribly swollen and tender. He seemed to be bleeding uncontrollably into his joints. The doctors did what they could to stem the flow of blood with some rather crude and painful treatments. If he fell over and bruised himself in order to stop him from overbleeding, they would um, tie tight bandages around his legs or around the joints to prevent the bleeding and the swelling from becoming too great. Once when he was uh, uh, reading and writing, he, uh, a pen nib got stuck in the roof of his mouth. And in order to stop the bleeding, they had to take the rather drastic step of cauterizing the roof of his mouth. And the way that they did this was using um, a liquid that would burn, something like a hydrochloric acid, on the end of a paintbrush and painting it onto the roof of his mouth. It was such a painful treatment that it had to be done with um, Prince Albert and Queen Victoria well out of the way because they really wouldn't have enjoyed the sound of him screaming. Be a brave chap. No one could explain to Leopold what was wrong. His doctors stressed that every bump or bruise might lead to a fatal bleed. So he was kept a lonely prisoner in his room at Osborne House. What no one at the time knew was that Leopold's problem was genetic. He had a rare inherited blood disorder, haemophilia. Haemophiliacs are missing a vital component in their blood that allows it to clot when the body is injured in a bump or a fall. Joints are particularly susceptible. The problem with haemophilia is that people uh, tend to bleed, apparently spontaneously. This probably occurs because, although we don't realise it, when we're walking around, we're getting minor injuries and cuts in tiny little capillaries and blood vessels in the body, which in the normal circumstances, in normal people, would be repaired, the clotting would occur, and there wouldn't be any bleeding into the joint. But if this process doesn't work, these minor, uh, apparently spontaneous internal bleeds, obviously are not controlled, and this leads to internal bleeding.
Just at the time when Leopold's doctors were struggling to understand his disease, the world's first medical paper on haemophilia was published in Germany. The Queen's unfortunate son, Leopold, was one of the first people in England to be diagnosed with the disease. It was a terrible revelation. To have been told that a son of yours had haemophilia in the latter part of the 19th century would have been very serious news and indeed akin to giving somebody a death sentence because in the absence of effective treatment at the time, very few children with haemophilia would have survived into adolescence. Although Leopold spent most of his time hidden away at Osborne House, in public he was made to keep up appearances. Victoria was told of the haemophilia diagnosis, but there was no way a woman as powerful as Victoria could reveal that her bloodline might be tainted with a genetic disease. It could ruin her children's chances of marriage. Even though doctors at the time realized haemophilia was hereditary, it is unknown whether Queen Victoria herself ever really understood this. After all, haemophilia had never been seen before in her family. It was never clear that Queen Victoria knew about the hereditary nature of haemophilia. She herself didn't have haemophilia and she doesn't believe that anyone else in her family from the past had haemophilia, so how can this be an in inherited disease? Alexander Kelly and his brother Giles are haemophiliacs who have just the same symptoms as Leopold did. And like him, there was no history of the disease in their family. Alexander had um, lots of bruises on his ribs, just literally fingerprints uh, on either side of his ribs, um, where somebody had just sort of picked him up and cuddled him. And uh, I thought that was really unusual and was a bit worried about what could be causing that. They did some blood tests and after about three days they um, eventually diagnosed that the fact it was um, haemophilia. It was quite a sort of shock. You just expect your children always to be healthy and, and fine. For Carolyn, like Queen Victoria, the haemophilia came as a complete surprise. It is now known that over a third of all cases of haemophilia arise spontaneously, rather than being passed on from a parent. And that's what appears to have happened to Queen Victoria. But there was something else that baffled 19th century doctors. Why is it that only men suffer from haemophilia? And women only pass it on? Modern science can explain why this is. Women like Queen Victoria can only carry haemophilia because they have two X chromosomes. The faulty gene for haemophilia is carried on one of them, and the other good chromosome compensates for this. But men have only one X and one Y chromosome. So when they inherit the faulty X chromosome from their mother, they have no good gene on the Y to compensate. Although Leopold was the only son to inherit the disease, any one of the five daughters had a 50-50 chance of carrying it. There was no way of knowing where the genetic curse of Queen Victoria would crop up next. It wasn't long before disaster struck. When Queen Victoria's grandson, Fritzi, aged just two, tragically bled to death from a minor injury, it became clear haemophilia had spread in the royal bloodline. But Victoria still refused to believe there was a family connection. Part of the role of Queen is to have princes and princesses and, 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 and keep the royal family going throughout Europe. That's how they keep power going. And to know that your family has a blood disease like this is, um, is a time bomb. So I don't think Queen Victoria would have wanted to realize that it was inherited. Unlike his nephew, Fritzi, Leopold didn't die in childhood. Unusually for the time, he survived into adulthood. 
He was desperate to marry, but rumors of his health meant he was turned down by several potential brides. Eventually, he found happiness with a German princess, Helen of Baldeck, and had a daughter. But he couldn't escape his hemophilia. Leopold did live to see his first child born, um, but he went on a short trip over to Cairns, where in the Villa Nevada he um, had another of his falls, and um, after a, a long period of uh, which they believed to have been blood seeping into his brain, he died, and he didn't live to see his second child born. Although many royal families realized Leopold's death was due to haemophilia, the gains to be made by marrying a descendant of Queen Victoria blinded them to the terrible risks of inheriting the disease. Queen Victoria's children went on to populate the houses of Europe with not seeming to know or care that, that haemophilia might have been an issue. And I think in reality, what was more important was their royal blood, not the possibility of tainted haemophilia blood. The trouble with hemophilia is that um, one never exactly knows when it's going to strike. Not every uh, daughter is necessarily a carrier, and not every son necessarily suffers from it. So therefore they couldn't really stop marriages because of the risk of hemophilia. It was simply a risk they felt they were prepared to take, to, to close their eyes to. By the end of the 19th century, the Russian Tsar, Nicholas II, was scouring Europe for a wife. Although he ruled over an enormous empire, it was falling apart at the seams. What Russia needed now was strong leadership and a stable monarchy. But Nicholas was a sentimental man, and despite objections from his parents, he set his heart on marrying Alexandra, the granddaughter of Queen Victoria. Unwittingly, he had fallen in love with a woman who would destroy the Russian dynasty. It wasn't thought important that there was haemophilia or suspected haemophilia in her family because Queen Victoria had suggested that there was no haemophilia in the British royal family um, and it was very unclear whether Alex would be a carrier or not. Despite his parents' misgivings, the marriage produced four beautiful daughters. But all hopes for the royal succession depended on Alexandra producing a son. It was absolutely essential that Alexandra should have a son because in Russia, daughters couldn't inherit the throne. So after she'd produced three and then a fourth daughter, they were absolutely desperate for a son. And eventually when he was born, this was a cause of enormous rejoicing and great relief, of course. But at just six weeks old, their worst fears were confirmed when the baby, Alexei, began to bleed from the navel. He was a haemophiliac. Queen Victoria's gene had been inherited by the only heir to the Russian throne. It was a disaster for the royal family. In public, Alexei was frequently carried by a sailor to hide the fact that his joints were so swollen he could rarely walk. But it was still vital that he was groomed for the throne, and so in periods of respite, he went on parade with his father. It was essential that the Russian people saw him as a future ruler. It was thought that they had to keep, an ab keep it absolutely to themselves that, that Alexei was ill. Had it been known that the only son was potentially fatally ill, then the dynasty would have been weakened. Alexandra realized that she was responsible for bringing haemophilia into the Russian royal family. As her brother, Fritzi, had died of the disease. But at the time, she had no way of knowing that the odds of passing the disease on were as high as 50-50. Of course, she had this terrible sense of guilt because she was the carrier. She was responsible for introducing it. So she was desperate. Alexandra had no one to share the blame. She maintained vigil at Alexei's bedside tormented by his pain. The doctors could offer no help. A member of court wrote, Think of the torture of that mother. 
a mother who knew that she herself was the cause of those sufferings, that she had transmitted the terrible disease against which human science was powerless. There was no one Alexandra could turn to when Alexei was ill. Her only refuge was religion. She'd taken it on wholeheartedly and become deeply involved with and deeply um, emotionally attached to the Russian Orthodox Church. But she was also always on the lookout for holy men, mystics, who she thought could help her with her son, could bring her closer to God, could purge this terrible disease. The doctors didn't seem to be able to help her, so she looked for help elsewhere. In 1905, she met a holy man who brought hope of curing her son. The meeting was to change her life and that of the Russian royal family. The man's name was Rasputin. Rasputin seemed to have a strange power to calm the child and also calm his mother. It's known that Rasputin had some sort of hypnotic abilities or powers. There were several occasions when Rasputin's appearance seemed to halt the bleeding and uh, cure Alexei. Or at least that's how it was read, and certainly that's how Alexandra read it, and that's why she would have no truck with anybody who um, spoke badly of Rasputin. Rasputin gained enormous influence in the family, as they believed he had mysterious powers to cure Alexei's suffering. These powers were put to the test when the royal family were on holiday in Poland in 1913. The journey there was a nightmare. The rough road caused an old injury of Alexei's to start to bleed. His whole trip was agony. But worse was yet to come. For ten days, the bleeding continued, with no sign of stopping. There was nothing the doctors could do. It looked like Alexei would die. They even had public death notices prepared. Finally, they telegrammed Rasputin, who had stayed behind in Siberia, to ask him what they should do. He sent one back, which said, do not grieve, the little one will not die. Only don't let the doctors bother him too much. And this had an immediate calming effect upon Alexandra, who was desperate by this stage. And remarkably enough, in a day or two, Alexei began to get better, having been at death's door. The recovery was pure coincidence, but the royal family fell under Rasputin's spell. He gained extraordinary power over them. And when Nicholas joined the troops at the front, Alexandra left Rasputin in charge. It was a mistake that would destroy the family. During the First World War, Rasputin had only to say, we've got to sack the, the Minister of the Interior, we've got to sack this one or that one, for Alexandra to tell Nicholas you've got to sack him. And this is what they would do. In the end, the whole cabinet was simply appointees of Rasputin. Whatever he said simply carried the weight. Now. Uh, the aristocracy, especially the members of the royal family, they were very worried about this kind of very malign influence which he had over, over the empress and over the emperor. The monarchy was becoming discredited because these rumours were flying about of um, sexual relationship between Alexandra and Rasputin, um, all sorts of debauchery in, in high circles. And as time went on, people were more and more determined that Rasputin had to go. Rasputin was murdered in 1916 by members of the aristocracy. But it was too late to save the monarchy. Revolution swept through Russia, and on the 17th of July 1918, Alexei and his family were herded into a small room on the pretense of having their photo taken. They were executed by firing squad.
Queen Victoria's haemophilia gene had played a terrible part in bringing to an end the 300-year-old Romanov dynasty. It might not be too much to say that the final assassination came about because of the haemophilia. The fact that the, the Tsarovich had it, that Rasputin gained this undue influence over the Empress and over the Emperor, and that the family, the royal family then lost a great deal of their popularity. And I think the revolution would have come anyway with or without the haemophilia. But nevertheless, it was a contributing factor. And in the end, the, the imperial family simply had to pay the price. It wasn't just in Russia that the monarchy was under threat of revolution. In Spain, one of the grandest royal families, the Bourbons, were only hanging on to power by a thread. And here too, the tainted blood of Queen Victoria would spread disaster. Aged just 19, King Alfonso XIII fell for the blonde good looks of Ina, a granddaughter of Queen Victoria, ignoring the warnings that she too might be a carrier of haemophilia. Alfonso XIII knew all about the haemophilia. By then it was pretty well known throughout the courts of Europe. But he was a very daring, very dashing young man, simply prepared to take the chance. And she looked to him so beautiful, he couldn't believe that she could be a carrier, which is nonsense, of course. You don't have to look like anything to be a carrier. But he was ready to, to take the chance, and he thought it was, it was a risk worth taking. When their first son, nicknamed Alfonsito, was born, it appeared the royal line was secured. But at his circumcision, the terrible bleeding confirmed the worst. The heir to the throne had haemophilia. The Spanish people believed the boy's poor health was a punishment for centuries of greed and overindulgence in the monarchy. The king could not forgive his wife. I cannot resign myself to the fact that my heir contracted an infirmity which was carried by my wife's family and not mine. I know I'm unjust, but I cannot think of it any other way. In Spain especially, where there were so many uh, political assassinations, it was very important that the heir was strong and healthy. I mean, there was a rumor spread by the peasants, believed by the peasants, that a young Spanish soldier had to be killed every day so his fresh blood could be pumped into the air to keep the air alive. Now, a lot of people believed this. As Alfonsito came of age, he only made brief public appearances, confirming the rumors that he was unfit to rule. It was a godsend for the growing Republican movement. Well, the fact that there was hemophilia in the family um, weakened their position a great deal. As the Republican movement grew in Spain, so um, did the Republicans realize that, that uh, they really had a stick to beat the royal family with, because there was a, a strong chance that the, the dynasty couldn't go on. Hemophilia was the final straw for the Spanish royal family. In a ballot in 1931, the monarchy were evicted from the throne and Spain became a republic. The desire to marry into Queen Victoria's bloodline helped destroy two of the greatest royal families in Europe. But haemophilia was not the only disease lurking in Queen Victoria's family blood. It is said that Prince Albert always lived in fear of bringing out what he called the hereditary malady in Queen Victoria. He was referring to the so-called madness of Victoria's grandfather, George III. King George went down in history as the Mad King. But in fact, his medical records reveal that his strange behavior was caused by a mysterious illness passed down through the royal bloodline. It was at a time when no monarchy could appear weak. Just across the channel, a bloody revolution was breaking out in France. A letter written at the time records the start of George's problems. This letter is dated the 20th of October, 1788. Very important. It's right at the beginning of George III's illness. It's written to his Prime Minister, William Pitt. You can, you can see at the beginning of the, of the letter he, 
starts writing in, in a, a very legible, very neat cursive script. I've not been able to answer Mr. Pitt's letter sooner that the writing is becoming more and more illegible. He says at the end, <coughs> I'm afraid Mr. Pitt will perceive I'm not quite in a situation to write at present. He's apologising to Pitt at the end. In fact, it's, it's very revealing of, of his mental state. I think it underlines the fact that George isn't, in a modern sense, mad here. He's not suffering from any insanity, neither is he suffering from senile dementia. Uh, that's it. Now rest, 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 rest. The letter reveals that George was aware that he was not his usual self. For days he'd suffered from cramps, shooting pains in the legs, and blisters on his skin. He barely slept and was extremely agitated. At the time, George was attended by the royal physician, Sir George Baker, whose notes on the case are still preserved. His doctor was in a terrible position. He didn't know what was causing the king's bilious attacks, and yet it was his responsibility to make him better. Baker initially puts uh, the king's symptoms down to eating four pears and treading on wet grass. He's, he's not got a clue what's going on. As the disease unfolds, they really can't attribute it to anything apart from a very obvious diagnosis of insanity. But the doctors failed to observe King George closely enough and ignored symptoms that might have helped them make a diagnosis. <coughs> An obvious physical symptom that, that modern doctors would have, would have seized on is the fact that his, his urine changes colour to this, well, it, it's likened um, to black currant jelly uh, later on. It, it becomes a very sort of dark, purpley colour. That the urine, which is such a, a telltale signifier of what's really going wrong with his insides, is completely ignored and it's thrown away. Each day with him, the, pain is in a different the doctor's place. diagnosis was of vital importance. When they started to suggest that the king had gone mad, it threw into doubt his ability to reign. But what they couldn't possibly know was that there is a rare genetic disease which causes temporary delirium and terrible pain, called porphyria. Professor Tim Cox at Addenbrooke's Hospital still sees patients today with porphyria. It's a disease that affects the whole body. Sufferers are missing a vital element in the blood. Without it, chemicals build up and poison the blood. These chemicals can even cause porphyria patients skin damage when they're exposed to light. George III had the pains that we associate with this condition acute and severe attacks of pain in the limbs, in the muscles, in the back, and also in the abdomen. There may be mental disturbances, uh, agitation, a rapid pulse. There are reports that he had skin sensitivity to light, so exposed skin would show blisters and be painful on exposure to bright sunlight in particular. <coughs> Unfortunately for the king, his doctors were scrabbling around for a treatment, and in doing so, only made things worse. Do you good? Do you very, very good? Baker prescribed a dose of James's powder, a remedy popular in the 18th century for treating fevers. Do you very well? But it contained a poisonous metal called antimony. That's excellent. I would not be at all surprised if it induced uh, porphyric attacks. A whole range of drugs are dangerous, and even little differences in structure may induce an attack. Literally hundreds, maybe thousands of drugs in common medical usage today will trigger attacks of porphyria. The medical profession as a whole still believed in this medieval idea of, of the humours of the body uh, uh, that, that were carried by bodily fluids. And um, any illness, really, any bodily illness, was treated by trying to attract the humours out or, or letting them out. The last thing his body needs, of course, is uh, additional pressure on the stomach. But what Baker does is give him a whopping great dose of laxatives, which just goes straight through him and uh, means that he's even iller than when he started. For weeks, George was subjected to bizarre treatments. Painful blistering agents were applied to his skin. 
cups we used to try and draw out the ill humors. Uh, ah! Very good, Your Majesty. Ah! They were certainly no help, and probably only made him even more dazed and confused. Yet despite the terrible treatment George received, he had periods when his attacks of pain would subside, and he would appear quite normal. Patients with porphyria that I know are not mad. They're only mad because they're in pain or deluded during the acute attacks that they suffer. And in between times, they, they are perfectly normal people, and therefore their sanity is ne never comes into question. By February 1789, George was sufficiently recovered to return to his duties at Windsor. The country had managed to survive what they thought was a temporary episode of insanity. But had it been known that this could be passed on to George's heirs, the consequences for the royal family might have been very different. If George III's subjects had, had known or, or been made aware that it, it was indeed porphyria, from which he was suffering a hereditary disease, which carried in itself the seeds of its own destruction, then I think they would have been tolerated a lot less and we could have seen the end of the Hanoverian dynasty. The present queen would not be with us. And the installation, perhaps, of either a, a, another suitable Protestant dynasty, um, reigning constitutionally, or perhaps Britain would have been a republic. If George did have porphyria, then where did it originate? And how far back in the royal family can it be traced? To find out is a real detective case. Because the porphyria gene can lie hidden for generations and then trigger an attack out of the blue. Porphyria is transmitted from generation to generation as a tendency. And it's perfectly possible for a, a generation to, to, to be, as it were, missed. They've inherited the trait, but they don't show the attacks. Scientists now believe they found striking evidence of porphyria 200 years earlier, in George's great-great-great-great-grandfather, James VI of Scotland, James I of England. James was one of the most unusual kings ever to sit on the throne, by turns described as a genius and a buffoon. Could Porphyria explain his bizarre personality? The answer could lie here, in the British Library where an extraordinary clue was found. The medical report of James I. The notes were made by a pioneering physician, Turke de Mayern. He was the first to systematically record his observations and so provides a remarkable daily account of James's sufferings. On the 12th of July, 1613, he says that the king it woke up in great pain and he then vomited and he was in pain for most of the day. He had difficulty passing urine, his pulse was very fleeting and his urine was very bloody, turbid, like Alicante wine. This is a glass of wine from the Alicante region of Spain. It's very dark. This wine colour may be seen uh, in the urine of patients with acute porphyria. The urine may be just darkened, tea coloured, it may be slightly pink, particularly on standing, or it may take on this sort of colour as with a patient of mine who recently uh, was beginning an attack of porphyria and noticed that her urine had changed colour in this way. On its own, dark-coloured urine is not enough to diagnose porphyria. But my own recorded many other symptoms that were remarkably similar to those suffered by George III. My own notes that James suffered very, very often from stomach pains. He also suffers from constant diarrhoea and that he's got a very delicate skin which can hardly stand anything on it. And he says this more than once. Many of his physical diseases are brought on by his mental state. James went down in history as something of a paradox. 
He was known to be extremely learned, yet was also described as a fool. He could fly into a rage and the next minute be cowering in a corner. When James died unexpectedly on the 12th of May 1618, it was widely believed that he'd been poisoned. But in fact, porphyria is itself a form of blood poisoning that can cause sudden death. The extraordinary details left by Mayerne revealed that another king, like George III, who was labelled as mad and unstable, may have in fact been suffering from porphyria. I think we can say that porphyria was transmitted down genetically from James I, and indeed that James I himself suffered from attacks of acute porphyria in his lifetime. But if James had porphyria, who did he get it from? Can it be traced any further back in history? His doctor's report holds a clue. It states that King James compared his colicky pains to those that were suffered by his mother. It suggests his condition was inherited. James's mother was Mary Queen of Scots, who reigned over Scotland from Holyrood Palace. This was the backdrop to a short but turbulent reign involving three marriages and one murdered husband. She went down in history as a wild and passionate woman, prone to hysterics. One of the things that Mary Queen of Scots was known for was that her health, although often robust, was punctuated by episodic illnesses. And really after the age of about 16, every couple of years, she went down with something. And the symptoms were always the same, vomiting, abdominal pains, tears, depression. She would take to her bed. Uh, on one occasion, it was said that her whole appearance changed. Unfortunately, Mary's instability was often dismissed by her male physicians. Mary Queen of Scots was des described by her doctors at, at times as being hysterical. And I think, again, this may represent the distress she encountered during the times of acute illness and when she had flitting pains in her limbs and in her abdomen. And when they examined her, they could find nothing to account for it in, in terms of conventional medicine. Like George and James, Mary's illness was never truly explained in her lifetime. But if the diagnosis of porphyria is correct, then it is possible that it could be traced as far back as 1566. But if so, where is it now? Did the disease disappear? Or could it still be lurking in the bloodline of the British royal family? The latest DNA technology offers a chance to finally solve this mystery. A sample of DNA from a sufferer could provide evidence that the porphyria mutation was in the royal bloodline. But to get a DNA sample means exhuming actual royal bones. The hunt was on across Europe for a descendant of George III who suffered the telltale symptoms of porphyria. Historian Professor John Roll found a remarkable clue in letters written by an obscure German princess, Charlotte of saxe meiningen She was a granddaughter of Queen Victoria and a great-great-granddaughter of George III. Charlotte had a series of mystery illnesses, the symptoms of which were never fully explained. But a closer look at her letters seemed to show that porphyria had struck again. She was complaining about headaches, about lameness, terrible stomach pain, uh, blisters on the skin all the time, this kind of thing. But I couldn't place what was wrong with her until I turned the page. I remember the uh, date of the letter was the 7th of April, 1906. And there on page two, three magical words in line four, urine dark red. And suddenly I'd realized that the porphyria that George III had suffered from had actually got through Queen Victoria to Queen Victoria's eldest daughter, Vicky, and through to her eldest daughter, Charlotte of Prussia. Charlotte raised a new possibility for biochemist Professor Martin Warren, who was also on the hunt for the porphyria gene. He realized that if they could get hold of a bone sample of Charlotte, then he could look for the porphyria mutation in her DNA.
In 1997, John Roll obtained permission to exhume Charlotte's body. And with Martin Warren, he went to the gravesite to extract a crucial DNA sample from her body. The grave itself was in very good condition. And once they took the, the large stone slab off and we saw the, uh, the, the lead-lined coffin remains, I mean, on top of that, in fact, were the remains of a flag which had obviously been used to drip the coffin uh, at her funeral. We saw her skeleton, we saw her hair, we saw what looked like the remains of flowers that she might have held in her fingers. Martin Warren then put his hand into this hole and pulled out a femur. I was then able to remove a few bone samples uh, from the uh, remains of the coffin and this was uh, you know, one of those defining moments which may allow us to determine whether Porphyria uh, had racked the royal families of Europe or not. For the first time they had a royal sample of DNA from a potential sufferer. This was a chance to finally prove whether Porphyria was in the royal bloodline. But Charlotte died in 1919. Such old DNA is extremely fragile. They had to extract a perfect sample to decipher her exact genetic code, letter by letter. Now, the trouble is that when you're looking for a mutation within a gene, it's very much like looking for a needle in a haystack. It is one typographical error in a chapter of a book. And there are maybe five or six thousand characters within that chapter. And it's a case of trying to find one change, one letter change within that book chapter. So it's extremely difficult and extremely tedious. But after months of analyzing the data from the bone sample, they found a single letter change in part of Charlotte's DNA sequence. This one change was genetic proof that Charlotte carried a mutation in the Porphyria gene. To double check that it was a new mutation, they sampled the DNA of over a hundred people. No one else had this mutation. We found the actual mutation in her DNA. To me, there's absolutely no doubt whatsoever possible that this is what she was suffering from, indicating that it must have come to her through her mother, Queen Victoria's eldest child, Vicky, that Queen Victoria herself must at least have been a carrier of the disease. To me, the case was absolutely clear-cut. It now appeared that Queen Victoria had carried the mutation for two critical royal disorders, haemophilia and porphyria. Since our present royal family are directly descended from Queen Victoria, there is a likelihood that by genetic chance, Porphyria might strike one of our present Queen's generation. In fact, it has been discovered, only one step removed from the throne, in the Queen's cousin, Prince William of Gloucester. Prince William of Gloucester was in many ways a rebel prince. He was a kind of daredevil royal court in the gilded cage, and he tried very much to break away from the constraints of, of royal life. Despite this tough image, Prince William was plagued by illness and was sent to see Dr. Hedley Bellringer. Whilst investigating the case of Porphyria and the royal family, Martin Warren received a revealing letter from Dr. Bellringer, who had diagnosed Porphyria in Prince William. This is what uh, Dr. Bellringer wrote to me. He said, um, he said, faeces and urine were sent to Addenbrooke's Hospital in Cambridge, where it was reported that porphyrins in the faeces were considerably in excess of normal, and that is a very characteristic symptom of somebody suffering with porphyria. Taken with reports from other doctors, this was proof that porphyria was found in Prince William. It suggests that he inherited the gene from his grandfather, George V, who was also the grandfather of Queen Elizabeth II. The problem for hereditary monarchy is that once there is a genetic disease in the family, 
it is very hard to get rid of it. The drive to maintain a pure, unbroken royal bloodline has ensured that more than just wealth and status were inherited. Genetic defects were passed on too. And when blue blood was all that mattered, many royal families paid the ultimate price for this deadly obsession.